Hi there. I want to talk about landscape design in Rhino. My understanding is that there would be two modes of representation which you might pursue, the conceptual and representation. A conceptual design arises from scratch where you design it and you build it from ideas which you've developed and refined for your project. However, you also may want to have a more accurate representation of what already exists. So in this instance, we've got um, the topology of Uluru, which is pretty complex. When talking about conceptual designs, it's not all that easy to come up with something from scratch and then articulate that in three dimensions. Um, as a designer, you'll probably understand what a plan is and a section is, and they can be pretty useful to assist you in figuring out the spatial relationships and the height relationships of certain elements. Here I'm in Illustrator with that previous sketch and I've roughly sketched out some things. Um, I wanted to have a water body, a plinth for the house to sit on and some garden beds. I've sketched out some arrows with some slopes, some pluses for some hills and minuses for the water bed because that's got to be in a depression. And then I've also added roughly um, what I might think that those elevations might be of certain points. It might be four meters up here, one meter for the path, negative 0.5 for the lowered garden bed, etc. The question now is then how do you get an idea of what this might look like in three dimensions, given that you have at least a plan and probably a section as well. So here I am in Rhino 7 and I'm going to try and make this landscape become 3D. The first method I'm going to try is by using both a mesh and a NURBS surface, um, we, both with control points. And I'm going to try and change their elevations to have roughly what I diagrammed in the sketch. So from the top view, I'm going to select the Lasso tool, which I have an, as an alias. And I'm going to roughly select these points. And then I'm going to put negative one meter, negative one thousand. And I'm going to deselect half of these points, hold control to make sure it's a minus, and I'm going to bring that down another 1000. Now I'm going to do a little bit for the hills as well. Bring them up 1000, deselect some around here and yeah bring that up some more so now i've made the elevation changes rough elevation changes using the simple gumball tool um, you can see that it's becoming quite jagged edged now the nerb surface and the mesh the mesh has points which have faces between the points and the NURBS is different because it's a surface which is interpolated through the points, just like a NURBS curve versus a polyline. So if I wanted to smoothen this with the control points on, on both the mesh and the surface, I can select the points, do the smooth command, and I can tell it how much I want it to bring back the um, smoothness of the, of the surface. And you can see how that's created a nice smooth blurred mesh and a nice smooth blurred surface on the right. But the problem is, and this is where it gets quite tricky, is if I want to do accurate adjustments, like if I want this to be 1.5 meters, 2.5, if I want the path, just the path, to be plus one meters only, if I want the garden bed to have a rigid, sharp edge at 0.5 meters below the datum and with a sharp edge, or the garden to be raised above, similarly, it becomes really difficult, especially when we're dealing with a control point grid like this, uh, because we just don't have enough control. Ideally, it would be good to be able to form a surface for representation using the curves and features that we have already drawn instead of manually adjusting a grid of points to fit our design. So the way I'm going to do this is to use the curves which I've drawn and divide those curves by a distance and those points along those curves will be used to create the mesh. Now, the ideal way to do this is to be able to draw the contour lines but if you're not entirely sure how that's going to be in your head, this is a simple way where you can use symbols like this and simple curves to make that topology. So I've just activated a new layer, layer 3, and I'm going to create a 
I'm going to use ellipses. So I'll go from here, make an ellipse like this. Another ellipse here, because we know that once that area wants to be 2.5. And another ellipse here, maybe four, like this. I click and drag and make that two again, so I make that a bit smaller. What I can do from this view is take the take this, raise it 2,000. Take this, raise it 4,000. This one, 2,500. And this one, 1,500. I'll also create some ellipses for the water. So minus one here, minus two here, minus two here, minus one here. So I'm going to bring those two negative thousands down to 1,000, down 1,000. And I'm going to bring that down 2,000. I'm going to set the garden beds to be the right heights. So I'm going to bring that down 0 0.5. And I'm going to bring the rest to their respective heights. Bring the plinth up to 2,000. Now I'm going to make some adjustments to the path. Quick tip, cage edit here is a fantastic tool to edit curves with. Do the cage edit. I can do uh, a line, do this sort of point from here to here, and ask for the point count. I'm just going to have three this time. Press enter, and there's my press enter again. And then I can just literally bring this up a little bit as I want. Now the, the path is going up and down according to that line. So now I've roughly set the heights of the different parts of the landscape and go into Grasshopper. With Grasshopper open, I want to show you the small script that I've made uh, to create the mesh. So I've got a geometry container and I'm going to put in the curves which I want to reference. So it's the yellow curves, the orange curves, the blue curves, the red curves and the green curves. So I'm going to select one of each and I'm going to do the select by color, cell color command right click on the geometry container, set multiple geometries. I've got a divide by length component and I've flattened the points output. I've set a number sl slider from about 1000 and then it goes into a Delaunay mesh component and a custom uh, material output. Firstly, I'll show you just what the mesh looks like. You turn that on and then I put the preview of that. You can see that what's happening is that all of the points are being created along the curves and the Delaunay mesh component is using those points to triangulate the mesh and you can already see that that's it's pretty accurate compared to what we were doing before this is an, a decently accurate way to get a landscape with specific heights and you can see that the paths the path is following uh, the, there is a flat area where the path is so here we have the mesh and the mesh is accurate to the curves that you put in your design which are easy to do instead of using the grid which already exists. Now if I bake this out, go to the top view and then do the drape command, drag it over the mesh, you'll see that a surface has been created which follows the mesh. And if I wish to, I could smooth this surface as well. So I'm just going to 
bit too exaggerate, I'll do that. You can see that's too much. Control 2, I'll do it down to maybe here. And you can see that that's sort of smoothing things off a bit. There's our surface, and I'm going to contour this. So do the contour command. Go from the base, go up, and I'm going to do layers of 250 mils intervals. Now there you can see the contour of the mesh or the surface that's been draped over the mesh. Now this would have been very difficult to create just by hand. Um, you have to visualize it better. So it's uh, working from just a couple of curves that we drew by hand and those curves have then been able to create the final contour model. And when I contoured the mesh, you could see that this is what's created. Now, if I wanted to do uh, contouring of the path, that's very difficult to visualize in your head. So uh, this is an advantage of that. Let's say you wanted to accurately represent something which already exists. Now, again, an easy way to do that is to use points. Um, you can get a point cloud from a LiDAR image such as this, which is a GeoTIFF image of Dover in England. Or again, you could use contours if you've been given them. And the contours can be sourced from various places. You might be able to get them from the data file, the shape file from your government, or they may be illustrated at various other places. So for example here, so this image is from Google Maps and Google Maps has shaded Uluru. And it's also given us contours at 100 meter intervals with 20 meter sub intervals of that. Now I could have used these, but I also found this uh, contour map from a book, which seemed to be a bit more accurate. You may have access to um, contours which have been drawn and they're, they're on the internet or your government might have that data in a shapefile, vectorized contours at specific intervals. But if you only have access to the um, JPEG on the internet, you can take a snapshot or you can download a JPEG, bring it over into Illustrator and do the image trace line art option and go expand and ungroup everything and then you can go object path join or control j and it closes the path and that's just automated the process for you so you don't have to join it anyhow i found this image uh, from a pdf of a book and it doesn't have those closed lines and the lines are quite pixelated so this is a manual job in rhino I placed the image on the ground and so from the top view I traced all of the contours onto their respective layers. One thing which was interesting when tracing these contours is that you get a subtle idea of what's going on with the, the geology and the topology, something you would not get if you automated the process. Sometimes doing it by hand is just better um, even if it takes longer. You, um, you actually learn a bit about it instead of just getting it done quickly. So for example, I was learning about these grooves which seem to go um, southeast to northwest and how there are some steep areas of the contours in this area and this area and some more shallow areas here where the gradient is less. Now that I had the contours drawn, I opened up Grasshopper again and it's a similar process to what we did before. Take all of the curves, dump them into a geometry container, feed them into a divide by distance component, also feed them into a control points component. It extracts the control points which I drew. So it's the automatic control points plus the control points that I drew. I've flattened them, flattened the outputs, put them into a new container, put them into a mesh, you can see what it looks like as a triangulated mesh. And that's what has resulted here. I baked that out and this is what you get. But you can see how it's quite jagged edged and it's not perfect. Thanks to Rhino 7, there is the quad remesh option, which smoothens things out. It does lose a bit of accuracy, but it's much more presentable. And even though the quad remesh has these sort of ridges here, it's still a pretty accurate representation of the volume or the mass of Uluru, just from the contours that were given in that book. So I smoothed the meshes using the smooth command a bit, and you can see the differences between the first and the second one. So here it's a bit sharper edge there, and it's a bit smoothened off here. And finally, I used the drape command over each 
um, of the quad remesh and the triangulated Delaunay mesh. For the quad remesh, I used the settings of a target count of, count of 40,000, adaptive size set to 70, adaptive count true, and hard edges as false. So I hope you found this video useful. It wasn't really intuitive uh, for me to figure out how to make landscapes in Rhino and I wasted a lot of time doing it. But I think that the curves method using Grasshopper is accurate and quick and you can use a drape command over that resulting mesh to, to get something that looks decent and that's done very quickly. So if you enjoyed the video, please like it and comment below if you found any more useful ways than this. Cheers.